Hello and welcome back to this series on warrior cats and ecology. Today's topic is that of small populations and some of the challenges they might face. Once again, this series is for a college project, so all sources will be displayed on screen, in the credits at the end, and in the description. Part 1. Population Density and Carrying Capacity We'll start off talking about population dynamics. Population dynamics are how a population changes over time, usually for things like the number of and ages of the organisms. A rather simple formula for the concept is that of BIDE. It's an equation that basically says the size of a population at any given time is equal to what it was at the start, plus any births, plus any immigration into the population, minus any deaths, and minus any immigration out of a population. BIDE is a way to calculate population growth, often referred to as recruitment when things are added and survival when things are taken out. It can also be associated with both density-dependent and density-independent factors, which we'll be talking about later. A 2011 paper cited that the best ways to control population growth include that of having there be less births with more adults, having more juveniles but not many of them live, and having very high density population, which could cause stress for the would-be mothers. Juvenile survival rate is the most common means for controlling population size. Remember how in the prologue to Into the Wild, Blue Star mentioned ThunderClan would need more kits if they were to survive? A study on prairie voles seconds that high density leading to high stress might make it difficult for females to successfully have young. Another way animals, and in this case cats, might control their own populations is through their behavior. A study modeled populations to find out how aggressive cats act in certain living scenarios. The model used the system called the hawk-dove bully game to determine how cats interact with each other. Hawks are individuals who are always aggressive, doves are never aggressive, and bullies will act tough but back off when their opponents start to escalate too. It found that cats were mostly bullies in high density, but always hawks at low density. Cats in low density areas have to be more defensive over their resources, but higher densities, like clans, might only be aggressive to outsiders if they feel like they have to fight. In cases like the clan cats, this can prevent population growth from immigration because they'll often chase away any loners and kitty pets. All this talk of low and high density brings us into the next topic, carrying capacity and density dependence and independence. Carrying capacity is how many organisms an area can support before it can't anymore. Because carrying capacity is limited by resources, we'll talk about it more in the next video on prey. Now, density dependent and density independent factors are sometimes referred to as deterministic and stochastic factors, but we'll just be using dependent and independent for clarity's sake. These things may affect a population's numbers. Density dependent means that it's reliant on how many individuals are present before things start to matter. These are issues like resources and sickness. The more cats, the more food they need to find, and the easier sickness can spread. Density independence, on the other hand, it doesn't matter how many organisms are there. It's very non-discriminant. These are things like weather or natural disasters. That Prairie Vole paper from earlier noted that climate was a big factor in vole survival. It doesn't matter if there's only a handful of voles or a million voles. When it gets too hot, they start to die off. We won't be talking about density independent factors in this video. That's something for down the line. For now, let's talk more on density dependent factors. Part two, real life consequences. Let's start with a big issue for density dependence, disease. Having a lot of something in the same area means it can be much easier for contagious sickness to spread. For cats, perhaps the one most talked about is toxoplasmosis. It's a protozoan parasite that's bad for many species, including humans, and it's transmitted a lot through cats. It's probably the most talked about because it can be transferred to humans as well as causing problems for other animals. Purely stray and feral cats may be worse off than free-roaming owned cats because they can eat more intermediate hosts carrying it, like small mammals and birds. It's also something that mother cats can pass to their kits. Then there's FIV and FELV. FIV is feline immunodeficiency virus, while FELV is feline leukemia virus. A model based on several studies was run that found that they weren't likely to cause a population of cats to go extinct, which is pretty good, for the cats anyway, and it found feline leukemia had a lower infection rate than FIV. However, having both at the same time is the real kicker for those unfortunate ones. A study done over three years in the zoological gardens of Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, sampled 75 cats to get an idea of disease in that population. It was mostly surveying for toxoplasmosis, because it's a zoological garden and they wanted to be sure these cats weren't going to be a health concern for any of the other animals being housed. One interesting thing about cats is even though cats could show symptoms of toxoplasmosis, like fever, weight loss, and abdominal discomfort, some cats don't. Sometimes cats are asymptomatic. You don't want to be showing any sign of weakness when you live out in the wild. 
Other diseases and the like that it found the cats to have included FIV, feline leukemia, ticks, fleas, lice, and some other viruses. The prevalence of all of these, including toxoplasmosis, fluctuate from year to year. Next, genetic variability. Unfortunately, this video isn't for going far into genetics. The basic thing you need to know is the bare bones concept that everything has two alleles each per trait, and a lot of different alleles in a population for that trait is good. Many things can affect allele frequencies. It includes things like a bottleneck, when a population is suddenly cut down and has to build up from just a couple of individuals, founder effect, when some traits get really prominent in a population compared to other places because the small group of founders of the population had it, and any other large population size fluctuations. There's also gene flow, the movement of organisms and therefore genes between populations, and genetic drift, how allele frequencies and therefore traits and species change over time. It's an entire intro bio course, and I just don't have the time to get into it, and I hope you'll all be taking it yourself if you haven't already. Large declines in population tend to be the biggest cause of diversity loss. A study done in the middle of the Indian Ocean on an Antarctic island over 12 years did some work with cats. It found that there was a reduction in the number of adult cats year to year, but with less competition, it could lead to an increase in births and immigration. Fluctuations they found in genetic diversity were tied to the fluctuations in population abundance. Another study of cats on an island is Dirk Hartog off the coast of Australia. By taking a genetic analysis of the cats, they were able to determine the genetic diversity, how often the populations had gene flow between them, and how often new cats were introduced to the gene pool. It found the cats there were rather fecund. The cats were often able to breed between 6 to 10 months old, and could have 2 to 3 litters per year, which is a lot of cats. They found there wasn't a lot of gene flow in recent generations. Some other interesting causes of allele frequency changes. Neutering and spaying. It takes out those alleles from being able to breed into a population. It may also be causing cats to be more against people, seeing as cats closer to humans are more likely to be sterilized. There's also a chance for color genetics being something that influences behavior. Orange cats are more aggressive, which is why they're at a higher frequency in rural areas. If you'll recall, low density places like rural areas leads to more aggressive cats kind of feels like the opposite of warriors with the noble firestar and all the broad-shouldered dark tabbies. What are some solutions to the genetic diversity issue? For one, density-dependent dispersal and selection can help against diversity loss. Gene flow can be really good to spread new genes around in a population if there are other populations able to share. An interesting case of all of these, we're back in Antarctica again. It's believed the cats on the island were brought in from four founding cats in the 1950s. This was a case of bottleneck, of all the cats in the world, this population had to be built from just four. There could be a founder effect present, but the article neglected to mention if anything was notable. Usually the founder effect only applies to diseases or weird mutations. Instead, there's a surprising amount of diversity in the genes of those cats, possibly from mutations. Because the island is free of pathogens and competitors, the cats were numbering in the thousands by the 1980s. Likely, they've hit carrying capacity, as they're very well established on the island now. Part of why there got to be so many was also due in part to the abundance of resources. They were eating rodents and rabbits that people also introduced to the islands, as well as the native seabirds. We'll get into this stuff a little more next video. Another thing we'll be getting into is extinction and extirpation. Extinction is when there's no more of a species left. Anywhere. Extirpation is when something is locally extinct. It may not be found in one area, but it's still in the wild somewhere else in the world. There's a paper on the platypus that I found, which doesn't exactly fit the cat theme, but they are something very susceptible to genetic issues as small populations. Smaller populations risk inbreeding and a lack of genetic diversity. Lack of genetic diversity decreases their fitness, their ability to survive, and it can leave them vulnerable to extinction. Platypus are in trouble for having fragmented and island populations, which can lead to inbreeding, genetic drift, and restricted gene flow. The amount of a species to maintain a healthy population and for how long varies by species. It varies usually by a particular species' life history and their breeding system. For the platypus populations to be sustainable, they could use a couple hundred or thousand. It's a little harder to say for cats. Part 3. Book Talk. And at last, we circle back around to warriors. First order of business. So we all know warrior cats don't act anything like real cats. We mentioned in the introduction video how the average number of cats per clan is around 30, and we're not really sure how high it can go. All we do know is that if anyone loses their food sources, they're probably done for. Carrying capacity has to kick in at some point. Maybe. If the errands let it. 
they don't seem to be very limited by resources, actually. But we'll talk more about that in the Prey video. You may notice by now that a lot of density dependence centers on food. It's a pretty easy one to talk about. As for things like sickness, thanks to all the medicine cats for doing all the hard work around here and keeping major outbreaks mostly under control. From our point of view, the cats aren't sick all the time, and are usually quick to get rid of things like ticks. None of the sicknesses the cats have are given human world equivalent names, so it's difficult for us to say what they have. Not a lot is documented either. I tried checking the Warriors wiki in case we got word anywhere of what illnesses the cats got, but there was nothing concrete. For instance, I'm pretty sure it was said Leopard Star died of diabetes, but the cats don't know that, and why should we? We're just told green cough and white cough, but it could be anything. One study even found confirmed cases of H1N1 swine flu in domestic cats, so no telling what warrior cats can be contracting or from where. Forget about toxoplasmosis and FIV. And the sticky topic of genetics, which is a whole mess that could be its own video with warriors. We're going to do all of us a favor and not really get into it, but the main thing that we do know is that hardly anything hazardous ever shows up. Big mutations are rare, if they ever happen. Most of the issues with genetics of these cats doesn't actually come from the cats themselves, but instead all of us in the fandom trying to piece together a good family tree or ships while avoiding too close of inbreeding. These cats have a serious problem with gene flow because there's rules against having lovers outside your clan. And a population of 30? Uh, it's not the greatest for long-time biodiversity. But we'll close that can of worms where we have it. And that's all for this video. Thank you for watching, and I hope to see you all again in the next installment.